Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like Nico's Black Vespa. Thanks, Nico. Hello, Penguinauts! I'm the Biddy Penguin, and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Kicking off today's episode with a launch from Abla Cosmodrome, the launch pad where we put our most toxic, most dastardly, and insane rockets to launch. A nice, safe hundred kilometers or so away from Baikonur, and this is the rocket I teased in the previous episode, the UR-600. Now, it looks a little janky, but it does have a reason for looking the way it does. It's the core of the UR-700, it just doesn't have the side boosters. But we're compensating for some of the loss in performance by using pentaborane. Yes, that isn't Mountain Dew, that is, in fact, one of the most toxic rocket propellants in existence, combined with high test peroxide, providing a beautiful green plume. And I mean, it's green. It's got to be good for the environment, right? Never mind that we're launching this 100 kilometers away from any inhabited areas. And let's just not even think about the possibility of it exploding on the launch pad, because Abla Cosmodrome would be a pretty quiet place for the next 1,000 years. So this is launching Zatminye. That translates to Eclipse, which gives away the intention of this launch. Beautiful shot of the pretty colossal fairing deployment there. It took a long time to design that, let me tell you. This is going to head to the moon to become our very first lunar space station. Yes, we're finally putting ourselves on par with the Americans and their Skylab station. You can see a really good look at the pretty interesting design of this core. I tried to get it as accurate to the design documents as I could with these three upper stages sort of blending into the lower stages there, which are essentially a stretched version of the UR500 with vacuum optimized nozzles. Unfortunately, as you can see, we have an ignition failure. We haven't used these RD0216 engines before. They're actually the UR100 engines, which only got added in a relatively recent update to RO engines. And I would quite like to start using them because they are very, very cheap. <laughs> and honestly, that's the crux of it. We want to be using cheaper, simpler launch vehicles. This is an incredibly cost-effective launch vehicle, even using the exotic propellants. Unfortunately, even though they are actually quite reliable hypergolic engines, we've never fired them before, so of course, it's pretty inevitable we're going to have some early failures, but we should be able to build up some test data and make them into pretty reliable workhorses in the coming episodes. But unfortunately, we are going to have to attempt to launch Zatminye another time. So, in the meantime, while we rapidly try and build another one, we're heading back out into deep space, where we're joining Phobos Grunt, which arrived at Mars in the previous episode, along with the rest of the Krasny 3 mission, including Marsacod, which is now just about gone to sleep on the surface of Mars. Now, as you can probably ascertain from the name Phobos Grunt, Phobos Surface, again, for the people who aren't native Russian speakers, which does include myself, I just make prolific use of Google Translate, which is why I often butcher the pronunciations or use verbs when I'm meant to be using nouns. Thinking of the bear, which I named Nisti, which is actually the verb to bear rather than the actual animal. Whoopsie daisy, thanks for correcting me on that. I should probably have a dedicated channel in my Discord for native Russian speakers and actually ask them before I name things in the future. But uh, alas, that would require a little bit more preparation. So we're actually heading over to Phobos to land not only on the surface, but to take a piece of that surface and head back to Earth with it. We've got a return to Earth window in a little over a year. It's actually around the same time as the Earth to Mars window when they're at their closest point. So we want to go land, take a surface sample and return it. And because of that, we want all the Delta V we can get to make sure we can get back to Earth okay. So we're doing the same trick that we did with the rest of Krasny 3. We are air braking. We're dipping into the atmosphere at 65 kilometers, just high enough that we aren't going to damage our spacecraft. Although you did see the antenna getting a little toasty on the last pass. I did push the periapsis up a little bit after that one. And we're just letting it tumble through the atmosphere and do the work for us, saving a whole bunch of fuel. I did actually design this mission such that they could do it entirely without air braking but this just gives us a bigger and bigger safety margin every time we do it. Just to really guarantee that in case I screw something up and decouple a stage, 
we might still be able to make it back home again. And we're actually using entirely reaction control thrusters for this. But because we have access to some of the larger thrusters, we've slapped four of them on the bottom. And it actually gives us a pretty powerful set of engines, which allow us to fully deeply throttle them because they're very simple pressure fed hypergolic engines. And that actually means that there's no chance of these engines failing. If this goes wrong, it's entirely my own fault. Getting a little surprise flyby here of Phobos. We just happened to encounter it after one of our error breaking passes. So we're just getting a little sneak peek, just wetting the whistle, giving it the eye and say, oi, we'll see you in about four months because there is a whole bunch of low Mars orbit science that we want to get first. So once we've done a few more error breaking maneuvers and lowered our apoapsis below Phobos's orbit to make sure we aren't going to accidentally intercept it, and smack into it. Pretty low chance considering the size of its sphere of influence, but still just a risk we don't want to take. We're going to actually leave Phobos Grunt dipping into the upper atmosphere of Mars, getting a little bit of science, and also getting science from low orbit around it. And that'll take around 90 days to complete, after which we will go in for the landing. We have over a year before our return window, so we're not in any rush. We'd like to maximize our science gain. I did, however, realize, as you saw there, that letting it tumble through the atmosphere was actually a pretty bad idea because all of that talking around and actually generating lift on the spacecraft body ended up inclining our orbit by seven degrees relative to Phobos. So we had to perform a correction burn there, which did eat into our fuel savings. But regardless, we still have dramatically more fuel than we would have if we'd done everything with engine burns. So there we are, it's in the orbit we want, and now we're gonna head back on over to Earth, where the crew of Soyuz 15, Estrella, from the Latvian SSR named by Lady Lags a lot, Roos from the Netherlands, named by Supernova99, and of course, Peter de Kerman from the European Space Agency, who performed the very first extravehicular activity during his stay aboard Salyut 4. They've returned safely. I actually let Karnasa return these ones and thankfully this time he remembered to fire the braking thrusters so they managed to exit the spacecraft with their teeth intact. And the same day we're going to be launching Soyuz 16 and we have an entirely rookie crew on this mission. We have Edvard, from the Ukrainian SSR, named by Kivarix. We have Eli from the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, named by Unplugged Lamp, and that is the very first cosmonaut from the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. Big day for international collaboration within the Intercosmos program. And we have Changa Kerman from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, named by Stella 2022. Yes, we have a North Korean cosmonaut on board, which is a lot of fun. And hopefully this will put to bed all of those rumors that we were going to add North Korea as a nation, maybe get TD channel to get to Mars with 37 meters per second of Delta V and a stick and a rock. Regardless, there is our motley crew in the Soyuz admiring a beautiful sunrise and enjoying zero G for the first time. Speaking of new nations though, the reason why this episode has taken a while is entirely your fault. Yes, you, you right there, I'm looking at you. It's your fault for demanding that we add China. If I'd known quite how much work it would be to add RO and RP1 support to all those Chinese parts, I probably wouldn't have agreed to it. It was a Herculean effort, but it is finally complete. You can go download the 1.5.1 version of the mod pack with all those parts in the description below. And that has finally enabled us to add Calvin McClure as the Chinese space agency or whatever the ridiculously long joke acronym he came up with for it is. Go check out his teaser on his channel if you haven't already. It will be a little while before his first episode because of course we have a lot more stuff going on in a shorter space of time whereas he's going to have to build up the rate at which he can build rockets, his first episode will likely encompass at least seven or eight months. So you've got a little while to wait before that first episode comes out, but go over and subscribe for when it does, because I'm sure it's going to be truly something special. In the meantime though, Soyuz 16 is arriving at Salyut 4, and it may in fact be our final low Earth orbit Soyuz launch. A little more on that later as we see Edvard going out for an EVA with the beautiful Ukrainian SSR flag on his shoulder and Changa and Ellie getting comfortable inside as we complete our rotation contract. 
Now we're just launching Progress 4 from Plisetsk to make sure they have enough supplies for the next few months. What did I mean about Soyuz 16 potentially being the final launch of a low Earth orbit Soyuz? Well, I'm thinking we might just replace it with the TKS spacecraft. We've got three UR-700s being constructed which will be launching that spacecraft to the moon to visit the Zatminya Luna space station because I truly could not be bothered to be launching separate crewed Soyuz and resupply progress vehicles all the way out to the moon. These episodes would take a phenomenal amount of time if I did that. And I thought, well, why don't I just launch the crew with all the supplies they need for the mission in one spacecraft? And why don't we also do that for our low Earth orbit space stations as well? So we may also be replacing the R11 launch vehicle and just going all in on Universal Rockets because they're just so much cheaper. We're heading back out to Mars and its moons now with Deimos Grunt. Yes, of course, we didn't just launch one of these. We're sending a lander to each of Mars's tiny little potato moons, doing the same aerobraking tricks to save ourselves a bit of Delta V, although Deimos is in a much higher orbit, so we can't save quite so much. And Deimos's sphere of influence is truly tiny. It is a pebble in space. So really, we have to treat this more like a rendezvous with another spacecraft rather than intercepting another celestial body. But there it is, the potato itself in the flesh. And we're going straight in for a landing. We've got all of the high space above Mars science that we can gather with these spacecraft as they've been orbiting for a little while. And so we're just gonna go straight in. Yes, of course, there is a whole bunch of orbit science, but I would rather just get that orbital science later and get this first in as soon as we can, just for sheer cool factor. Although, of course, this isn't the first spacecraft to land on Deimos. Machina 4 actually beat us to it on the 10th of October 1965. Those pesky Americans didn't even intend that mission to land on the moons of Mars. It just happened to have enough fuel when it got here and landed on both of them. But it didn't return surface samples or really do anywhere near as many science experiments as we're going to do. We're going to be there to stay for months and sample the surface and send back lots of juicy data to accelerate our research speeds back home. This mission really is providing a bounty of science and I'm pretty sure our research speeds are starting to leave N9 in the dust, which is all too important for getting to that first lunar base milestone. We have to research some pretty advanced technologies for that and we want to get there first. They beat us to landing the first Kerbal on the moon, but we want to be the first to send Kerbals to stay. It's another reason why we're investing in the UR-700, because the N2 can only launch 140 tons to low Earth orbit, and it costs a whopping 457,000 funds and 150 days to build. And for reference, one fund in RP-1 is equivalent to 1,965 US dollars. So that's $457 million per launch. The US 700, by comparison, can launch 170 tons. That's 30 tons more. That's without using pentaborane, because I don't really want to launch crew on the pentaborane variant. And that costs 332,000 funds. So 332 million US dollars. Still a lot, but almost 130,000 funds cheaper than the N2. It's also considerably faster to build at a mere 115 days. And so it just doesn't make sense to keep using the N2. It was a lot of fun to use a Hydrolox evolution, sort of see what that would look like, but I just can't ignore all the people in my comments who are like, why aren't you using the UR-700? It's a much better design, considering the limitations of Soviet industry and the Soviet space program. Why don't you just use a monster rocket that uses simpler technology? But that will be in the next episode. For now, Deimos Grunt is approaching the pathetic rubble pile excuse for a moon that is Deimos, just orienting our solar panels to make sure they get the best possible exposure to the sun while we are attached to the surface. And I did say attached. We have a claw on the base of the spacecraft because the gravity is so pathetic we would just float off if we tried to use landing legs. So we have to actually grab into the surface to secure ourselves to it. And at a mere 0.1 meters per second, we touch down.
there we have it. Free to gather our surface samples and spend a few months getting a beautiful view of Mars and accruing our scientific data. Now the next episode will not take anywhere near as long to make. I'm going to try and release a few more of these shorter episodes a little more frequently. As some of you may have noticed, this episode released out of turn. It should have been N9 today, but N9 is extremely busy at the moment. So I'm just going to try and stretch out a few of these episodes and not get too far ahead in game time. We can't get too far apart, otherwise we can't do shenanigans that evolve both of us. But Kanasa will also be releasing episodes, and soon enough you'll have Calvin to add to the list. So Fak isn't quite back, but it will be soon, and we shouldn't have any more major updates to the mod pack. I swear I am not adding any more nations. I know every time I say that, someone's like, oh, we said that last time. Yeah, well, the only reason I added ESA was because the RO devs added a whole bunch of ESA parts and that made it easy. The only reason I added China is because the KIU and Kerwis mods exist. Even then, I had to add RO and RP1 support to all of them and it took forever. No way am I creating the parts themselves, which is what I would have to do to add India or Japan. If you want it in this series, you go make it. <laughs> that is the ultimatum. But I also have a new computer now, 9800X3D, and a truly insane 128 gigabytes of RAM. So that should dramatically accelerate the rate at which I can churn these episodes out. Have a lovely Easter, Penguinauts, and I'll see you next time. A massive thank you to my patrons for their generous support, and an extra special thank you to the amazing stake, Dakota Clark, Madzor, Peach Otis Tenet, Simone67, Scott Milligan, Lady Lags a lot, Jesse Smith, NX74656, Olaf Hammerhand, Jordan Millwood, Luna Nicole the Fox, Frosty Moon, Mr. Blue Star, Hendrick, Con of Class, F22 Raptor, and Kiverix.